Welcome back, my friends, to the show that never ends. Laszlo Montgomery here with the second episode of this brand new podcast, as if the history podcasting space wasn't crowded enough already. Hey, don't forget to check out the uh, China History Podcast if you haven't already. It's definitely one of the best China history-related podcast shows out there. Or so I've been told. Let's pick up where we left off last time. The Zhou Dynasty. When you're talking about ancient China, man, this is as ancient as it comes. There was maybe the Xia Dynasty, and for sure there was the Shang, but Chinese civilization, Chinese culture, as we recognize it in our day, this is where it all started. Zhou Dynasty. Lao Tzu, Confucius, Kings Wen and Wu, the Duke of Zhou, Han Fei Tzu, Meng Tzu, Guan Chong, Duke Huan of Qi, the first emperor, Qin Shi Huang. Hey, he was born during the last decades of the Eastern Zhou, during the Warring States period. The Shang Dynasty is famous for the oracle bones and the artifacts dug out of the ruins of Yin, the Yin Shu, outside of Anyang in Henan province, right on the Yellow River, where it all began for Chinese Huaxia civilization. The Zhou Dynasty saw the introduction of the three great religions of China, Confucianism, Taoism, and Buddhism. All three showed up on the scene roughly during the same time, during the Eastern Zhou. And all three religions will embrace tea, not so much for the taste, as much as for the health benefits, the rituals they will associate with its preparation and consumption, and the ability to offer a nice pick-me-up when needed. One religious sect in particular, Chan Buddhism, known in Japan as Zen Buddhism, incorporated tea into the religion itself. Now, I include Buddhism in this group of Chinese religions, even though it came from India. This religion, early on, as it wended its way around China, discovered the merits of tea and how it served as a perfect antidote for thirst, fatigue, and a myriad of life's ills and pleasures. And we'll see in the episodes to come how some of the greatest teas that Chinese masters will ever produce got their start in these Buddhist temples. Tea's journey from a novel discovery to a medicinal plant took its sweet time. Historians and archaeologists have uncovered all kinds of mentions of tea. There's a mention of tea being sent from Yunnan in 1066 BCE as a gift to the king. This would have been the infamous and final king of the Shang dynasty, Zhou Xin. Yeah, the wine pool and meat forest king, among other torture devices. Yunnan has the oldest tea trees around. I read 1,700 years old. They'd been using tea in Yunnan at least since the Shang Dynasty and had been boiling the leaves along with a variety of other natural products of the forest. I spent an afternoon once drinking tea in Chengdu with a lovely couple at their tea shop. Boy, they sure knew a lot about tea. He was from Fuzhou and his wife was local to Chengdu. Anyways, he showed me a photo he took in front of a tree in a secret location in Yunnan that he said was almost 3,000 years old. As far as China's recorded history goes in the Shang Dynasty, tea was certainly around and was being offered as tribute to the Chinese king from Yunnan, where tea production was said to have first started. Tea was something that would spread south to north. At this nascent stage of tea's history, there was no Chinese character for tea invented yet up in the north, where Shang civilization was, so there's nothing written about tea in the oracle bones or the earliest bronzeware. Knowledge of tea was still a secret south of the Yangtze River. There's also the Ganlu legend. This is the story of Wu Li Zhen. He lived during the time of the Western Han and Emperor Xuan. The legend has it that Wu Li Zhen was on his way back from India after a stint studying Buddhism down there, around 53 BCE. This was a common thing to do back then. These pilgrimages to the source of Buddhist teachings, well, somewhere along the way, Wu Li Chun had taken cuttings from seven tea trees and was carefully transporting them back to his home in Sichuan. 
and when he got to a certain spot on Mengding Mountain, Mengdingshan in uh, Sichuan Province, he planted these seven tea plants. This is about 125 kilometers southwest of Chengdu. Then, after some time had passed, and once these small trees were mature and ready, Wu Lijun regularly took cuttings from these original seven trees, and over time, these cuttings were planted all over Mengding Mountain, and he created a kind of eh, tea heaven. And this particular tea, snipped from these trees growing in the primordial tea forest somewhere around Yunnan today, that Wu Lijun had hand-carried all the way, and planted on Mengdingshan, from the original seven trees came this yellow-colored Mengding Ganlu Cha, Ganlu Tea. And so pleasant was this brew, in no time at all it became, well, too special for common people and was henceforth reserved solely for the emperor. Ganlu Tea also became known as Xian Cha, the tea of the immortals, because of Wu Lijun and his seven trees, this area in Sichuan, southwest of Chengdu, in Ya'an and Qionglai, a nice 90-minute, uh, two-hour car ride, is called the birthplace of tea cultivation in China. This is where it most likely all began. The original seven tea bushes planted by Wu Lijun are no doubt long gone, but you could still visit the spot where tradition said these original seven trees stand today. Protected, of course. We know that ginkgo trees were also planted in the same exact spot at the same time, and that these trees have been reliably dated to more than 2,000 years ago. Since at least the time of the Zhou Dynasty, tea was already well known to Buddhist monks. Performing all those daily devotions, sometimes these monks, even the abbot, well, they needed something to give them a natural boost to help them carry on throughout the day and do good deeds, and keep on keeping on. Tea became the answer early on. Buddhist temples were all aware of tea and cherished the tea plant, not just as a beverage and for its rejuvenating benefits, but also as a health product that, when mixed together with various other herbs and natural substances, provided medicinal relief or prevention of all kinds of Zhou and Han Dynasty ailments. Tea in these first centuries of the Common Era still hadn't become a fanciful and enjoyable beverage yet, not even for the aristocracy. They learned a few tricks in the Han Dynasty. They learned that steaming the tea leaves and then drying them before compressing the leaves into bricks helped cut down the bitterness. This was a big advancement. The spoilage was astronomical. Prior to steaming the leaves, they used to dry them by exposing them to charcoal fires. So with these meager advances, tea remained bitter and was mostly consumed as part of some brew containing other natural ingredients. In the records of the Three Kingdoms, the San Guozhi, considered the definitive source material for all things Three Kingdoms period, there's also a clear mention about tea that assures us in our day, again, that the Chinese in the 3rd century knew of tea. There's also a rather well-known story about the drunken Wu King Sun Hao, grandson of Sun Quan. This is uh, an ancient tea tale. King Sun Hao had a loyal scholar, historian, and courtier named Wei Yao. Now, his bio states in the San Guo Zhe, the records of the Three Kingdoms, that because Wei Yao had a weak constitution and in no way could hold his own in King Sun Hao's frequent bacchanals, he was allowed to yi cha dai jiu, to drink tea instead of wine. The good king cut him some slack. Even today, at some of these events where people gather and drink themselves into oblivion, if there's someone who clearly will not be able to participate, yeah, the host will let them off the hook and allow them to yi cha dai jiu, to substitute tea for alcohol. When I used to frequent these business dinners and banquets with all these officials... There was always someone doing a yi cha dai jiu. Like I said, all we have to go on in these earliest days are snippets here and there of these minor but definitive references to tea. You probably recall from previous episodes that when the Jin Dynasty fell and northern China was taken over by Mongol and 
Turkic tribes. A lot of the northern elites and aristocrats of the day, seeing dark times ahead, picked up and moved south. This was the first time in Chinese history a human migration from north to south happened on such a mass scale as this. Tea was already a familiar thing down in the south where it grew naturally. Now these northern aristocrats, fleeing to the south after the fall of the Jin, got to see up close for the first time what this was all about. This is how tea grew. Even though tea, or tu, as it was still called, had been around for so long, no one in China had yet figured out how to unlock all the magic contained inside the cells of the tea leaves. Tea's rise during the periods of the Shang, Zhou, Han, and through the Jin continued to grow in esteem amongst the Chinese as a stimulant and something natural that had acquired a reputation for ameliorating all kinds of ills. And like I said, during the Eastern Zhou, when all the three religions of China embraced tea, that too had a great impact on awareness about tea. Tea came from the southwest of China. That much was clear. Yunnan and Sichuan. That was about as far away as you could get from Luoyang or Chang'an. So those places never really fell under the tight control of the central government. The Qin state, and later the dynasty, were the first ones to go down there and crack a whip and get everybody on board. And it's not surprising that the Qin conquests of the southwest opened the door to the introduction of tea in greater quantities as a tribute commodity into the north of China. The oldest surviving Chinese encyclopedia dates back to 350 the peak of the Eastern Jin Dynasty, right after the death of Constantine the Great in the West. It's known as the Arya. This work is a pretty sacred text because it's attributed, at least in part, to the Duke of Zhou and Confucius. It explained in all the detail and authority possible at the time about words, family relations, utensils, Heaven, earth, the hills and mountains, plants, trees, animals of all kinds, and animal husbandry. In the Arya, tea is also specifically mentioned. It described tea as jia, third tone. That was the word for tea, jia. It was described in the Arya this way, quote, The plant is a small tree, like a gardenia. The leaves grown in the winter may be boiled to make a soup for drinking. Nowadays, those that are gathered late are called Ming. Another name for them is Chuan. The people of Shu, meaning present-day Sichuan, call them Kutu, end quote. Kutu could be translated as bitter tea. All these ancient names for tea are said to have begun with the good people of Sichuan. If you visit the wonderful National Tea Museum in Hangzhou, not far from the tea gardens of Longjing, You'll see, they say it was the Ba Shu people of present-day Sichuan province and the municipality of Chongqing who get credit for being the first ones to basically figure out tea. By the time of the Arya, it was known people in southwest China were cultivating tea. Before the kingdom of Qin, led by Qin Shi Huang, united all of China, they first had to knock off all their opponents— in 316 BCE, 56 years before the birth of Ying Zheng, the Qin sent their military machine down to the southwest, and they rolled into the kingdoms of Ba and Shu and folded that area into the unified China that they were cobbling together, conquest by conquest. And along with all the other agricultural riches of this one-day Sichuan province were all of its tea trees and cultivation know-how. And thanks to the Qin conquest in the 4th century BCE, and later on after Ying Zheng beat off his last rival and unified the land, he declared himself China's first emperor. And as far as all that culture and all the other good things from Sichuan, including tea, all of that began to more naturally flow northward, albeit slowly, towards the central plain to all the major cities and towns of the Yellow River and its many tributaries, already ancient by this time. Again, this wasn't the tea you and I would be familiar with, but that would change, of course. And this is how tea first became well-known in Central and North China. 
What started off as a Sichuan and Yunnan thing, down in the southwest of China, deep in the interior, thanks to thousands of years of horticultural advancement, was now, and over the next several centuries, being planted, studied, and wholly embraced by those Chinese people who got to enjoy it for the first time. And although it was Yunnan and Sichuan who gave China tea, it would later on end up being the tea gardens in eastern China, Anhui, Fujian, Zhejiang, Jiangxi, and Jiangsu, who planted the seeds and cuttings from ground zero in Sichuan and Yunnan and developed their own teas that would later become world-renowned, and their leaves would be sought after by connoisseurs the world over, commanding prices in the thousands of dollars per kilo. Yeah, but in the time of the Zhou, the Qin, and into the Han, tea was still a bitter brew, man. And though it gave the imbiber a nice little buzz, and perhaps some solace and enjoyment, bitterness was still its defining characteristic. In this 3rd and 4th century BCE world, tea, or tu, or chuan, or she, or ming, (laughs) it sure was bitter, and mostly a health product and a luxury only afforded by the rich. No one had figured out quite yet how to process the leaves into an enjoyable beverage. The drink that Zhou, Qin, and Han era people were ingesting came from leaves straight from the tree and then later added into your cup of boiled water, Shandong style. Following the Arya of the Zhou was another great work called the Guangya that came out in the 3rd century CE during the Three Kingdoms period. This was another work filled with commentaries and updates to previous renditions of the Arya. The Guangya was a good example of a compendium that was produced to bring previous scholarship up to date. Scholars will keep doing this throughout the centuries in China. Every century or so, some great work would be commissioned by the emperor to bring the extent of human knowledge up to date and later on for literature as well. Here in the Guangya, for the first time, we can read the following, quote, In the district between the province of Hubei and Sichuan, the leaves are plucked and made into cakes. Those made of old leaves are mixed with rice. To make tea as a drink, bake the cake until reddish in color, pound it into tiny pieces, put in a chinaware pot, pour boiling water over them, and add onion, ginger, and orange. The drink renders one sober from intoxication and keeps one awake. End quote. Sounds more like a soup than a beverage, but everything was moving in the right direction. As I mentioned during the Qin, tea started to make its way northward and eastward. And later on, with the victories of Han Wu Di and China's whole integration with worlds beyond their borders via the Silk Roads, This facilitated the introduction of tea to others whose worlds came into contact with China. That, too, caused the repute of tea to travel even farther and wider. As I said, tea masters during the Han had brought their craft to a more refined state than their predecessors, but it wasn't yet a nice, tasty brew to look forward to in the morning or afternoon. The Liu Song Dynasty, 420 to 479, is about as early as we could reliably trace where the idea of real tribute tea began. This whole notion of tribute tea is important. What this involved was sending the best tea in the land to the emperor as a gift for his private use. And even though he was the emperor, well, he was still a man, and a man could only drink so much. So he had way more than he needed. And one of the perks of working for the emperor was... You also had access to these teas that were given as tribute. And not only the court official got to drink it, but his family and sometimes his friends as well. You remember the Liu Song dynasty. They're not the northern or southern Song who came much later. The Liu Song was the first of the southern dynasties during the southern and northern dynasties period, 420 to 589, that preceded the Sui. During the Liu Song, it was written, quote, 20 li from the city of Wucheng in Zhejiang, there is the Wen Mountain, which grows the tea reserved for the emperor as tribute tea. End quote. So, 5th century CE, not only has the cultivation of tea spread from Yunnan and Sichuan to the east of China, 
It's also becoming something so prized and valuable, it became worthy enough to be sent to the emperor as a gift. The great teas of China today, the ones you see for sale in dozens of websites or tea shops, all the most prized tea in all of China, pretty much all of them, started their brilliant career as an imperial tribute tea. And from this reputation, a particular village whose masterwork created the tea would gain legendary status and repute for being a tribute tea supplier to the emperor, and their tea would be even more prized and valued throughout the land. Later on, we'll look at most of these great and legendary tribute teas, and I'll let you know how you too can get your hands on a few hundred grams for your own personal consumption, just like his royal majesty. If you had to do or die and draw a line where tea for sure began to be drunk as a beverage and not only as a medicine, the Sui dynasty would have to be it. From the time of the Three Kingdoms into the Jin and later on the disunity that followed in the Nanbei Chao, the southern and northern dynasties, man, I'm telling you, a lot could happen in 360 years. During these years between the time of Zhuge Liang, Yang Jian, and Sui Wendi, the knowledge and wisdom of tea had advanced to a point where the drink started to become a true art and a muse that will spawn a million poems and paintings. But keep in mind, even though tea as a beverage turned a corner around the Sui dynasty, it was still a brick tea world and would remain so for several more centuries yet. Next episode, we'll focus on the Tang dynasty, 618 to 907. Here is where tea finally comes of age, and those parts of the world within China's influence gets hooked. So that's all for next time. Until then, this is Laszlo Montgomery signing off from fantastic L.A., located here in the Golden State, California, USA. Take care, everyone, and I hope you'll come back again next time for another flavorful episode of the Tea History Podcast. <laughs>